Good morning, everybody. Please take your seats and welcome to the 2019 Air Medical Transport Conference. We are very excited to welcome you to Atlanta this year. My name is Susan Rivers, and I serve as the Region 6 Director, the region that includes Georgia, on the Association of Air Medical Services Board of Directors. With each and every conference, AMTC organizers strive to make the networking, education, and trade show impactful. On behalf of this year's local host programs, Air Evac Life Team, and Medway Air Ambulance, welcome. I hope you're ready to have a great AMTC. Our next speaker, Rick Sherlock, President and CEO of the Association of Air Medical Services. Rick. Good morning, everybody, and welcome to AMTC 2019. We're excited to present another exceptional AMTC with a whole host of exciting educational and networking opportunities. Uh, before we proceed with the rest of the program, I'd also like to thank our AMTC partner associations. And I'd like to ask if any of the board members from the Air Medical Physicians Association, the Air and Surface Transport Nurses Association, the International Association of Flight and Critical Care Paramedics, the International Association of Medical Transport Communicators, or the National EMS Pilots Association to stand uh, and be recognized. I'd also like if there are any board members of the Medevac Foundation or the Association of Air Medical Services to stand and be recognized. We have great partner associations, and these are your board members, so please uh, get to know them and interact with them and have the chance to network with them as we go through the rest of the week. Again, AMTC would like to offer a hearty thank you to our host programs this year in recognition of their support and in what has become the custom, this year's conference decor features our local host programs on aisle signs, registration counters, and session signs. They also happen to star in the following video. Please play the video. Take two of that. Let's do that again. Okay. My name is Matt Lowry. I live in Jacksonville, Alabama, and I'm based in LaGrange, Georgia at AeroVac 77. The double seven.
Who's flown the most? I am. And who's who? Uh, who's better looking? I am. You, okay. And who's smarter? I am. Oh, 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 oh sorry. Uh, we have a great speaker who will be introduced in a few minutes. Uh, I'd also encourage everybody to come to tomorrow's general session where we not only have a second great speaker, but we also will uh, present the Patient of the Year Award and recognize the transport team uh, from East Carolina, Vidant, and uh, Paige Winter, our Patient of the Year. So I'd encourage you all to also come tomorrow to support that program. And at this time, I'd like to introduce Doug Gerritsen, the chair of the Board of Directors of Ames. Thank you, Rick. I'd like to offer a very special thank you to this year's AMTC 2019 sponsors. Simply put, without your support, it would be very difficult to hold an AMTC event enjoyed by staff and attendees alike. And so a great thank you to our patron level sponsors, Airbus, Medtrans Corporation, PHI Air Medical, our contributor level sponsors, AirMed International, Metro Aviation, Spectrum Aeromed, our supporter level sponsors, Airlift Northwest, Medevac Foundation International, Mobile Medical Repair, and our friend level sponsors, Air and Surface Transport Nurses Association, the Association of Air Medical Services, Use Aerospace Corporation, the International Association of Medical Transport Communication Specialists, International Board of Specialty Certification, Copter, and HealthNet Aeromedical Services. Lastly, a special thank you to our Ames Sim Cup sponsors, Air Methods Corporation and CAE, for their continued equipment support. A round of applause, please. <clears throat> a few matters of business. The official opening of this year's trade show will commence with a ribbon cutting at 11.35 this morning at Exhibit Hall entrance C1, which is right next door. While visiting our vendors, please make sure to take the opportunity to grab lunch either in the Exhibit Hall or in the food court that is close to Building B. The Community Awards presentation will begin at 7 p.m. tonight, right here in this same hall. Please come and support our awardees and grab a cocktail while you get seated. Please be on time, for we don't want you to miss any of our friends or your friends and colleagues who will be receiving their awards. There will also be a networking reception once the awards program is completed. Celebrate this year's awards winners, view their winning videos up close, and join us for some networking, some food, and some friendship. You still have time after that to step into downtown Atlanta and enjoy the evening as well. Once again, welcome everybody and enjoy AMTC 2019. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. My name is Brenda Nelson. I'm the Chief Flight Nurse for Airlift Northwest. And I think as many of us know and have same stories of how our program started, Airlift started after a tragic house fire in Sitka, Alaska, claimed the lives of three children. Dr. Michael Kopas, Director of Emergency Services of, at Harborview Medical Center and Medic One in Seattle, founded the region's first air medical transport service in 1982. His founding passion for excellent continues to fuel Airlift Northwest today. Serving the communities of Southeast Alaska, Washington, and throughout the uh, states of Idaho and Montana, we continue to strive to be the ultimate partners in critical care and believe that all people deserve access to emergency care no matter where they live. 
With a continued global focus on wellness and mental health, AMTC has selected a keynote with some knowledge and expertise on how to take care of ourselves. I'm very pleased today to introduce keynote speaker, Dr. Janet Seahorn. Dr. Seahorn has been a teacher, administrator, and consultant for over 40 years. She has taught a variety of classes on neuroscience and literacy as an adjunct professor for Colorado State University in Fort Collins, Colorado, and other Denver area universities. Jen has a doctorate in human development and organizational systems. Her background includes an in-depth understanding of human development and neuroscience research, as well as effective practices in organizational systems and change. She conducts workshops on the neuroscience of learning and memory, the effects of at-risk stress environments, brain development, and research-based instructional practices. Jen has worked with many organizations in the business and educational communities in creating and sustaining healthy, dynamic environments. Dr. Seahorn has researched and studied the effects of trauma on the brain and how excessive or extreme trauma can impact changes in the brain's neural network and how that change impacts behaviors in physical, social, and emotional interactions. Jenna and her husband have co-authored the award-winning book, Tears of a Warrior, a family story of combat and living with PTSD. This book will be available for purchase on the afternoon session. Please join me in supporting her in this work. Airlift Northwest and our whole team is honored to be here with you today as a sponsor of this morning's general session. It is a pleasure to introduce the renowned teacher and author, Dr. Janet Seahorn. Well, they told me that they would mic me as soon as I stepped on stage. So um, I kind of appreciated that and not before. You never know where you're going to be uh, in certain situations and you don't want the mic to be on before you're up here. I appreciate Brenda's introduction. I don't know whether now I feel super old. Uh, I have an identical twin sister like Brenda has. That changes your neural network from day, from day one. Um, but being able to be up here and talk about something like trauma and what happens to the brain, because so many people think that when someone experiences trauma, it just goes away. And for some people, if it's a one-time event, it may. But today, it's a little bit more than that. So I'm going to start out with a poem that I wrote. And it's in the book, but I actually wrote it many, many years ago when I was in a situation that caused extreme trauma uh, and would I be able to continue to live and raise our, our two sons and be a wife and a mother. It almost didn't happen. So the poem goes like this because it describes post-traumatic stress in a pretty clear manner. And it's called Silent Scream. You shall not see a silent scream when looking from outside, but you might catch a glimpse of it when peering deep in someone's eyes. You will not hear a silent scream in noisy, crowded rooms, but if you sat down face to face, your heart may sense its painful tune. You will not feel a silent scream amidst this fast-paced world but if you wander near to it, its anxious spirit might unfurl. We walk right past a suffering soul and often turn away, not strong enough to face the grief this world has made him pay. For silent screams are not unique for those who serve and die. The living warrior hell survived is left to hold his tears inside. I want to thank this Air Medical Transport Conference and its team and Natasha because she saw the TED Talk that I did a few years ago when I, at CSU, Colorado State University in Fort Collins, and it was all dealing with trauma. And I want to thank her committee for being brave enough to address this issue of post-traumatic stress. 
because it's often the elephant in the world, in the room. We work a great deal with military and especially veterans. And it is the one topic that for many decades that people don't want to address. They want to believe that you're just going to get over it. And if you're strong enough and you're brave enough and you just have that mental fortitude, it will somehow magically go away. But I've been researching this for 25 years. And that's not what we see, it's not what the research shows, but when we work with military veterans especially, many of them will tell us, especially some of the old codgers and the Vietnam vets were like, I did just fine, I had no problem. There was nothing wrong with me. The rest of the world just wasn't tough enough. These new kids coming up, they just aren't strong enough. But then something happened. There was a loss of a loved one, a serious illness, or you went into retirement. And that's when all hell hit the fan. When all of the memories that you were able to surpass because you were running so fast, you were so busy that you were able to keep them at bay for a while. For many of the people, it came back. Now, not everybody gets post-traumatic stress, but there was a World War II study that talked about if a person was in combat for 60 days or more and they saw horrible things, 98% of them came back with post-traumatic stress. And other people would say, well, what happened to the other 2%? The psychologist that did the study said, well, they were the psychopaths. And seriously, they enjoyed being in those situations. So as I start today, we're going to talk with that silent scream, because something to remember, when we learn, teach, and when we know better, we do better. For the first probably 25 years of our marriage, my husband was a Vietnam vet. He served in the jungles of Vietnam for 11 months. He was a, a right wing, I never get that right, I sound like a wabbit, a right wing helicopter pilot. At one time he was rescuing several people on the ground, trying to evacuate the wounded, and his helicopter, and he wasn't quite totally buttoned, buckled in, had a direct RPG hit. He was blown out, everyone else died. And when he landed on the ground, he was covered in everything that you can imagine from that helicopter. That's one of his flashbacks, that's one of his memories. All the time that he was in the jungle, his last mission that he got seriously wounded had to be medevaced out, spent over a year in the hospital at Fitzsimmons. Out of 150 of his troops, in that battle, 19 were not injured or killed. 19 out of 150. And he was one that was severely injured, and he was an officer. Now, because we didn't know this about post-traumatic stress, there were things that happened in our family that we had no idea what was going on. And a lot of times it would sound like he would blame me because he thought I was triggering him intentionally, like I had time to do that, right? Sit up night after two kids and working full time to write down things so I could piss him off. Now I know sometimes as wives we would like to do that, not terribly productive, but it wasn't accurate. Now, I come from an Italian background, so I don't handle being told things or accused of things when I didn't do it. And so I wasn't one of those nice little wives that sat back and said, it's okay, dear, I'll do better. I didn't kind of do that. So we were in this dance that wasn't real productive some of the time. But here's the interesting thing. 98% of the time, my husband was absolutely wonderful. He was a great 
father. But it was at 2%. And the brain for survival is always looking for that 2% because we were always waiting for when is it coming. And you were always walking on eggshells because you knew at some point it was coming. Now this is what I taught you, not really walking on eggshells, you're really walking through minefields and wondering when you're going to step on the next one and have something happen. So by definition, post-traumatic stress is an anxiety disorder that develops in reaction to something horrible happening, physically or emotionally, and it goes on and on. But as a brain researcher, they use the word disorder because in medical terms, you usually can't get somebody to pay for something unless they call it a disorder. So the way, but to, as a neuroscience, as a researcher, this is not a disorder. This is a reordering of your brain's neural network. And you just can't say, I'm going to forget this. I'm going to buck this up. I'm going to get over it because your brain and my College students always love this one, but you get a brain for one reason. Even my wonderful, or I call it mine, it's really my husband's service dog trooper. You have a brain for one main reason, and that's for survival. And the brain is set up so that every experience you get helps you stay alive. Because if you die, you can't procreate, you can't have sex. My college students always thought the sex part and procreating was so much fun that more fun than survival. But the survival, the brain encodes everything that's going on around it so it can say, I don't need this information, I'm safe. Or this was particularly dangerous. If we get in that similar situation down the road sometime, I need to be aware of it so that I can react and be safer in that moment. Post-traumatic stress, the other thing they don't tell you, it is a normal response to an abnormal event. Now, many people in our society, they may get stressed, but they don't have that abnormal event. So your brain, it's reacting normally. Remember, it's keeping you alive. It's keeping you into that survival. So it's a very normal response to an abnormal event. And as the American transport, medical transport team, you see a lot of trauma and you work with a lot of trauma. So key elements of how someone might be exposed to post-traumatic stress. Frequency. Now, being in education, we looked at children, and I worked in different areas that were in poverty areas, and kids came from and saw way too much at a very early age. And they saw it at a very frequent daily level and spousal abuse will come with this. But there are many things, this frequency, how often? And now that I worry, we worry tremendously about our young people is because of social media. You don't have to be out in a crowd anymore and have someone or have your brain terrorized. All you have to do is go on social media. And instead of just a few people seeing it, thousands and thousands of people see it. And the worse it is, the more people seem to be in tune to watching it. Duration, how long did it happen? Did it last just a few minutes? For some of you, you go and you pick up a patient and it might be very quick, but others you may have to stay on site for a very long time. So the duration, and we know with combat vets, durations of a battle can last anywhere from a few hours to some of my husband's lasted for several days. And that is constant trauma, and what the brain doesn't have time for is processing. If the brain can process the trauma, it can work itself through, and you usually don't go into post-traumatic stress. It's when you don't have enough time to process what has happened to you, and it builds up that, that we get into this realm of post-traumatic stress. And then the big one, and this is where you may only need one, the intensity, the intensity of a situation. Now, I was working in Jefferson County Schools when Columbine happened. 
and I was an administrator on special assignment, and I had gone out for lunch with one of my coworkers early because we had a noon meeting. And when we got back into the office, it was about quarter of 12. When we left, everything was fine. But coming back in, there was chaos everywhere in the office, and people were running around, and we were getting constant reports from police and firemen and different areas about what was happening at this school. Now, what you have to realize is Columbine was, for Jefferson County, our flagship school. It was our perfect child. It was the school that won all the trophies. It was the school that won all the academic honors. I worked in some of the high schools that we watched constantly because we thought, is there going to be a shooting in this particular area? It didn't happen there. It happened at Columbine. And that lasted for days. And for many people, this is what we call, this was their Achilles heel because our policemen and our firemen and our EMTs couldn't even get in the building. Columbine reshaped how we deal with school shootings. Because we didn't have a layout. Nobody had a layout of the building to give to anybody. We didn't know who the shooters were. We didn't know how we could get in and not cause even more trouble. So it took hours before we could even allow police into that building. And the carnage was pretty incredible. So the intensity that we see in something like that can really have an effect. You are what we call the sheepdogs of your community. In September, we were up in Steamboat for, my husband took me there for a few days for my birthday. And we like to do a lot of backcountry hiking, and we had our dogs with us. And we got behind this huge group of sheep. And when I say huge group of sheep, there were about a 1,000 of them. And the, they were taking them, just one rider on his horse, taking them down the highway. Can you imagine a 1,000 sheep on a highway? And we were at the end to where we had to wait till they were just going, because they were taking them out of their summer pasture to board them to take them somewhere else. But on this place, there were nine of these beautiful Grand Pyrenees. Grand Pyrenees are not nice dogs. You don't go up and try and hug them. You don't go up and try and get your dog out and say, like troopers, say hello, because they are trained. Now, you guys are nice people, but the Grand Pyrenees are trained to take care of their sheep, their herd, at all costs. That is their one and only job, is to make sure that their community, their sheep, are safe, and they will give their life to protect that herd, no matter what comes up. And they are on call day and night. You are the sheepdogs of your community. So some first responder incidents, when we look about, look about frequency, you may be vulnerable, and this is not all of you, but it may be someone next to you that some of the information we give you may help your fellow man, may help a patient when you come upon them, is the amount of first-hand exposure to extreme traumatic experiences. Shooting incidents and accidents, and we see far too many of those. Fires, earthquakes, tornadoes, we've seen a lot with a recent one down in the south area of Dorian. We want to remember our firefighters out in California because talk about duration. They've been on several fires out there for weeks and they don't get much rest. So anything they see, they have no time to process that. Terrorist attack. 9-11 has been a huge one. That was a one that I don't think our country will ever forget. Uh, when we look at, we call them in terrorist attacks, when we had the nine or the shooting out in Las Vegas, in churches, in other places. So these terrorist attack, and you have a massive amount of casualties. I know that when the Aurora Theater shooting happened down in Denver, that the policemen, and we have several police people here, 
we didn't have enough ambulances to get to the scene, so they were loading people into their police cars and taking them to the nearest hospital. And that had a severe impact on many of them. And then the violent crimes that are occurring in our society. And unfortunately, we don't even have to be around it much anymore. We just have to look at television. We just have to go on to social media. And it's on Facebook. So we can have all of this exposure without being aware that we're not even there firsthand. So statistics on your emergency medical teams, on a survey, 51% of you had pre-trauma health training. So over about half. 80% of firefighters have been exposed to at least one severe traumatic event. 90% of police and EMTs, 49% only 49% were offered some kind of psychological aid after a really traumatic event. Now this becomes the elephant in the room because they think because you're able to function that you're fine. Because what we found, at least with many of our veterans, you're fine as long as you are on task. My husband was great as long as he was working, as long as he had a mission, as long as he had a task, he was excellent at it. Where it came out was when he got home, when he had downtime, when we had vacations. And half the time when we were on vacation, we would end up in an emergency room because he thought that he was having a heart attack. And what it was was a panic attack. 85 were experienced sim uh, symptoms related to mental health issues. Now, this doesn't mean that something is severely wrong with you. It just means this is how your brain encoded that experience. And remember that because your brain, the neural networks has been changed, so have the hormones and the neurotransmitters. And the only way that that's going to be adjusted is if you pay attention to it and do something to readjust it. If you pretend it's not there, and those around you are shaking their head and said, yeah, it, seriously, there is something going on. Take a look and listen to them. 35 or 3.5% of regular general population adults, and I really think this is higher, may experience post-traumatic stress. But look at the difference. If you are an EMS worker, 34% because you're the ones, you're the sheepdogs. You're the ones out there taking care of the trauma. You're the ones out there seeing it on a daily basis. So the nurses study, how many nurses do we have? A lot. There was a study that came out, it was done in 2007, but it just came out in a nurse's publication this year, 2019. One in four nurses experience post-traumatic stress. And once again, we only have the D there because people don't seem to understand what PTSD is. It really is PTSR, post-traumatic stress reordering of the brain's neural network. Critical care nurses are the ones most at risk because you see them in the emergency room, but you also, if you are the ones on your flight for life or air transport, you see the worst cases because they do not call you in if it's just a minor incident. Your long shifts, and we know that we have a nurse's shortage. Little to no breaks, if someone is in need, you don't get to take a break. Debilitating workloads, if someone gets sick, doesn't come in on time, or you are short staffed, that lays on you. So your 12 hour shifts may end up being 20 or 24 hour shifts. And this was the most shocking. In that study, and they looked at all the variables. Now, as a researcher, we look at what could be accounting for this? What could be things that we can say, oh, this could happen to anybody. This is a fluke. It's not significant. We don't need to really pay attention to it. We need further studies. But when they took out all the important variables, the one thing that kept standing out was an increased risk of ovarian cancer by almost 25%. Now, that, to research, is statistically significant. Because in our afternoon, we will talk, station, we will talk about 
what happens when the brain has seen too much over and over and over again, your body wears out. Just like as you get older, I like to run. I don't run a lot now. I do more walking. Things wear out. Well, your body wears out faster when it's under stress. So we talk about how experience sculpts the brain. The brain does not care whether you have a good experience or a bad experience. It's one of those things that all of it's doing is it's encoding, getting information, encoding in it and saying, this is great, I really like sex. That's a cute guy, he's super. Boy, she's hot. We'll look for more of her down the road. All of these wonderful things. That's why a lot of people get on drugs because that experience for them was pretty wonderful. But it doesn't care if it's good or bad. All it cares about is it's going to let itself know that this was good and this was bad. This one I have to pay attention to you to, and this one I don't. Now, I don't know about you, but uh, supposedly most of us have a fear of snakes. So if you come along a st around a stick and you're hiking, and the first thing you think, it's a snake. Well, you don't look at it and talk to it and say, oh, I wonder if that's a snake, am I okay? You jump back because if it is a rattler, we have a lot of rattlers in Colorado, it's probably too late. Like our young puppy, our eight month old dog came up on a snake this year. Luckily it was a bull snake and he got very curious and it got bit. And we called the vet and said, well, he should be okay. And hopefully Brody learns you don't go next to snakes. But we know you don't have time to assess it until seconds later and then you look at the stick and say, oh my gosh, we're fine. This is the other thing that I think a lot of people don't know. The only way you get information in the brain is through our senses. Sight, of course, what we see. Sound, I think a lot of people that hear a siren that have been in traumatic events, you're pretty attuned to it. It's, this is part of your normal life. But someone else, if they hear a siren, it can really make them quite anxious. Touch. We learn from the time we're a small child, don't touch that hot stove. Certain things prickly, don't touch that. Taste, anything that you put in your mouth, this is how many of you have ever had food poisoning? And I can remember a year ago, I was eating at our favorite seafood restaurant and I really like mussels, well I did like mussels. And I had one mussel and it was open, it looked safe, I put it in my mouth and it tasted weird. And I thought, well, this can't be good, but you know, you're gonna, not gonna spit it out. This was a nice restaurant. Within an hour after I got home, I had, was severely ill for about two days. I'm still a little bit worried about having another muscle. We know that some of the people who work in Sandy Hook, when that happened, it was lunchtime and they were serving pizza to the little kids. And some of the first responders that went in they no longer can eat pizza because just the smell of pizza takes them back to that event. And if they had a small child that age, it made it doubly hard to just ignore and say, I can handle this. So that sense of taste can be huge or, and the sense of smell. My husband's therapist, Dr. Haig, at the VA in Fort Collins, he was part of 9-11 and helping out, digging out, is what they were hoping maybe they would find someone. He said to this day, his wife, they cannot have fresh, uncooked raw chicken in their refrigerator because it smells like the site when he was at 9-11. Now, trauma is the ultimate time traveler. All you need is one of these items, one of these senses to be activated, it's called your trigger, and it comes in nanosecond, and it puts you right back as if you were there at that moment. And you cannot talk yourself out of it, you just, if you get the right coping skills, you can breathe through it. You can do something that will help you get through that moment. Post-traumatic stress is a chicken soup of trauma. It puts a person in an alternative world. The ordinary world is no longer ordinary to them. 
And trying to fit into that ordinary world can be extremely exhausting and challenging. Now at CSU, I would have every once in a while students that came back from Iraq and Afghanistan. Some days, they were back into the classroom within a week after serving overseas. They had no debrief time. One of my students came back, and almost all of them sat by a door entrance, and my husband still demands to do this, where he can see who's coming and who's going. And they always did that. And if they couldn't get that seat by the door, they did not come in. But one of my students, I knew that he had had three tours of duty in Iraq. And he had had a couple, been in a couple of IEDs. So we knew we had some traumatic brain injury. But he was functioning academically quite well. But every time he came into class, and some days were quite warm, he would always wear a sweatshirt with a hoodie. About midterm, I noticed that he was no longer coming to class. Now, I was a type of professor, and my classes were small enough that when I noticed something, and I knew that this was a vet, and having worked a lot with vets, being married to a vet, I started checking. I finally got a hold of him and was able to, to determine what was going on. And he said, Dr. Seahorn, I had to quit. I had to get off campus. He said, I was getting to a point that all of those normal kids that were living their normal lives and the things they would talk about is, where are we going to go and get drunk the next night? Who are we going to get our next date with? Oh, I broke a fingernail. Oh, I don't like this professor. This is too hard. When he had seen so much in his young life, he said, I could not handle how nonchalant they were about what was important in life and what was unimportant. He said, I was pretty sure I was going to get in trouble because I was going to deck somebody. And I am pretty certain that he would. So after many years and he got himself back on, he went to one of these online institutions and got his degree and he is doing quite well. But he has tended to still isolate. Trauma causes a lot of loss. We found with our Vietnam vets and some of our other vets, many marriages, because wives and spouses can't sustain a relationship where things aren't going well for very long. And part of it is the inability to communicate. I know that when my husband and I got into disagreements, the biggest thing was we weren't communicating clearly. He didn't know what was going on. How could he talk about something that he could not have words to? It's like a two-year-old, if a two-year-old or if a child has these traumatic experiences before they were able to talk, we call it pre-verbal, all of those, that information is encoded into their brain in the unconscious area, but they're not going to retrieve it consciously because the hippocampus and the conscious level doesn't come on until about age two and a half, three. So some of that is not forgotten knowledge, it's unconscious. In fact, 80 to 90% of what we do and think is unconscious. Only 10% is actually at a conscious level. Challenges in maintaining anger and anxiety. And a lot of my students, I started to ask them about the third time we met to write on an index card something that would help me teach better or know something about them so I wouldn't make the assumption if something was going on, they would lay that on assignment that you were just a lazy son of a gun and I'm going to boot you out. It turned out that over half of my class, male and female, had some kind of a pretty good anxiety disorder and feeling that you need to be in control of everything. So this is the one that we talk about on my TED Talk. Being a military officer, and some of you being in your jobs, you have to be in control of everything. If you're not in control, someone dies, right? You need those extra minutes, those extra seconds, and you better do your job and you better do it right. So with my husband really being needing to be in control because that's in the jungle where he felt safe. If everybody had their rifles, their equipment in perfect condition, and were there on time, and he can control that, he was fine. 
Well, you can't control a wife, and you can't control two little kids, and we would be going skiing, and the first thing he would do is say, always military, we're going to leave at 0600. You're right. You're going to get two little kids up and dressed and fed to get in a car to drive down the highway to get to a ski area, right? And you're going to leave at 0600. That means you're in the car ready to drive out. So about five minutes after six, he's walking and he's looking. He's not helping, he's looking. This is very endearing to a spouse. About seven minutes, now he's starting to get verbal. Can you hurry it up? Well, yeah, I mean like, can you hurry it up? And the little ones are looking at him like, I'm half asleep, I'm really not hurrying. So about 10 minutes into it, he's going, now he's angry. Now he's saying things that you are deliberately sabotaging this event. We were going to leave at 0600 and you knew it now. He's talking to two little, a four-year-old and a six-year-old. <laughs> Cognitive skills of a four-year-old and six-year-old. We committed to six o'clock. This is like talking to the dog. Blah, 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 blah. Unless you say eat or go for a walk. So after that, now he's angry. Now we've got stomach aches. Now we don't want to get in a car with this maniac and be in this vehicle driving down the road. But we finally get there. We're driving down the road. The traffic isn't as bad as we thought or he thought and everything's fine, and all of a sudden, he starts to sing. Now, we want to kill him. We don't want to be in that car. We are not happy campers, and he's singing. Because now he's okay. He's in control. But we were not okay, and we weren't okay until about after lunch. But we didn't know until we heard about this thing, and I started work research in post-traumatic stress, and he went into a study at CU Medical Center on it where all of the people, the doctors and nurses, were Vietnam vets. So they had experienced the same thing that he had. But we didn't know that if you weren't on time, people died. We didn't know that if certain things weren't taken care of, and the equipment, people died. Would we have been able to do better? Maybe, but maybe we would have set the time back differently. So symptoms, and we'll go into this in great detail in our afternoon session, hyperarousal, that increased heart rate, and it's automatic when you start getting into that stress mode. The anxiety and the anger, the flashbacks and nightmares and intrusive thoughts, and those come whether you want them to or not. The difficulty sleeping, and this is the one thing I worry about with all of my students, but with anybody having a sleep disorder, because sleep is the time at night when you are able to cleanse the brain of the toxins that happen during the day. And if you don't get enough sleep, it builds up and builds up and builds up. It's like a little bit of washing machine going on in the brain to wash it of toxins. You don't sleep enough, you are already in deep trouble. And the avoidance and isolation, unable to return to work. And a lot of our military have done that, and a lot of our first responders have had to take that leave of absence or leave that profession because they can no longer go back into it and be exposed to that kind of an incident again. So important to know, prolong is as prolonged stre stress is as destructive to the mind as it is to the body. We will go into some of that this afternoon. And we have the word psych ache, coined by Dr. Edwin Seidman, which pretty much describes that, that silent scream. So something to think about when there is so much noise from past experiences that take up enormous space in the mind so that trying to find a place where you can find peace and a sense of safety, that's a huge challenge.
that's why we do a lot of things of what are some things that we cope with. And one of the things we like for us, nature is huge. Getting out in nature is a, so much better than going to a shopping mall because a shopping mall can be dangerous. Taking the dogs on a hike. And one of the big things for us has always been pets. And so we're gonna introduce to you soon our service dog, uh, Trooper. But healing doesn't mean that the damage never happened, that you should just forget about it. It only means that it doesn't ever have to control your life the way it did. It can still be there. You may not, we may not want to forget. We don't want to forget those we lost. But the wound is the place where the light enters you. And that's this afternoon we use the analogy of the Humpty Dumpty. The wound is the place where the light enters you. And that can make you more compassionate, stronger, better at your job, more knowledgeable, because you've had those experiences. Doesn't have to be this awful thing that sometimes we see about in books or the press. So in closing, I love this quote, every morning we are born again, what we do with it is what we decide and what matters most. So we're gonna leave you with this following song and I'm gonna bring Trooper up. This Trooper is our service dog. He came from Boston. He was raised in puppy behind bars. We've had him a year. Trooper? Come. He may or may not come without Tony. Come. Sit. Say hello. There's no one to say. No. Dad's here. Come here. Trooper. See how he watches Tony? <laughs> See, he knows that he's supposed to be with him. And so, um, Trooper was named by an Iraqi vet that came back and became a state trooper, and he gave him his badge number. So Trooper's name is Trooper 1760. So Trooper, speak. <coughs> oh, good boy. Okay. Trooper will be with us this afternoon. <laughs> He's not supposed to jump down there like that. So thank you for being here. We want to thank the committee because they want to take care of you, knowing that all of the rest of the stations are you learning more on how to take care of others. They wanted to make sure that you are taken care of and for you to take care of each other because you are the angels that are out there. You are the sheepdogs that help your other fellow team members cope and function healthy. So thank you for everything you do and for the lives that you save. All right, have a great AMTC. If you need something or there's something that the staff can do for you, make sure you look for someone with one of these badges. Uh, we've got the education session starting soon and the exhibit hall opening at 11.45, so have a great AMTC and we're off to a great start.